This is a Bible treasonous. Well, in this mock hearing, when it finally came to its closure for Joseph Smith, for Caleb Baldwin, Alexander McRae, Sidney Rigdon, Hiram Smith, they were then sent to a place called Liberty Jail. With Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail, his followers and believers who were pooled in, uh, in uh, Caldwell County, Missouri, had an edict from the, from the governor of the state that they must leave the state. Those people negotiated with some of the military officers that were uh, on, on the grounds and had until spring in order to leave. The question was where to go. And there wasn't a safe place to go. In Missouri, they could go down the river to St. Louis, but that was part of Missouri and part of the extermination order coverage. If they went north into Iowa, that was Indian country, there weren't settlements where they could find the refuge and food and shelter and work. And to the west was Indian territory. The best place to go was due east, 200 miles to a little town called Quincy, Illinois, which was on the Mississippi River. And it was the only settlement area where they could go. So Quincy is the logical community for many reasons. Not only did it have a sizable population, about one-third the size of the oncoming tidal wave of Latter-day Saints. But it was also well known as a humanitarian center on the Underground Railroad. Perhaps Quincy would be the place that would best service the Latter-day Saints. With church leaders in jail, we had a pool of about 7,000 Latter-day Saints in Caldwell County who needed to leave the state. They were given until spring by the military authorities. We have a refugee camp that has monumental proportions in the far west. For example, Lucy Mack Smith's front yard had beds and tents full of refugees. People didn't have enough shelter. They couldn't get back to their farms to get food. They were in a very destitute situation. The leadership uh, of the church in that area devolved upon Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball. They organized a committee of removal this committee looked at uh, the saints and surveyed the saints to see who needed help. They made members of the church pledge and promise that they would do everything in their power to move the poor. This pledge becomes a key pin in the story of Mormon migration ever after that. Joseph must have worried immensely as he sat in the prison at Liberty about how his wife and children were going to get out of Missouri. Of course, there were many friends who supported the Smith, and in this case, Jonathan Holmes and Stephen Markham stepped forward to help Emma load her wagon and take her children to travel uh, the journey to Quincy, Illinois. They had two horses, their horses Jim and Charlie. Emma had four children, a young baby, a two-year-old, and Julia and Joseph, who were older, and they made the trek. I often think Joseph must have been grateful that he married a bold and independent woman and had faith in her that she could survive such difficult circumstances. And they were difficult, even with help. When they arrived at the Mississippi on the 15th of February in 1839, Emma and the children got off the wagon. She took the two babies in her arms, Alex and little Freddie, with Julia and Joseph clinging to her skirts she crossed the ice of the mississippi river to get into quincy carrying with her were attached to her skirts bags with joseph's papers in them including the manuscript of his translation of the bible i think with joseph and her children with these sacred papers we have a sense of how closely emma was tied to him and to the restoration and what she was willing to carry forth as they moved out of Missouri and to a new life in Illinois. In 1838, before the Mormon War broke out, Joseph Smith received a revelation that the Quorum of the Twelve should go on a mission to England that they should leave on April 26th, 1839, from the Far West Temple site. After the Mormon War and after the exodus from Missouri and as the Saints were in a destitute situation, 
and also as the Missourians were still hostile towards the Latter-day Saints, the Twelve in Quincy knew they had to fulfill that prophecy. So on April 18th, members of the Twelve quietly and secretly moved across Missouri back to far west and in the middle of the night on the date set of April 26, 1839, they rededicated the temple site, they prayed, they sang, and they dedicated themselves to start their missions to the British Isles. Uh, they moved on and quickly made their way out of Missouri. This essentially marks the end of the chapter of the Latter-day Saints in Missouri because those saints who were left over in far west followed the Twelve out of the state. As the exiled saints were fleeing from Missouri to Quincy, Illinois, Joseph and several other church leaders were incarcerated here at Liberty Jail. Contrary to its name, Liberty Jail did not mean freedom for the Prophet Joseph. He and fellow prisoners remained here for months and experienced deplorable, even despairing conditions. For example, there wasn't any heat, adequate bedding, or outhouse privileges, and they often had to share the space with hardened criminals. Despite his confinement and loss of freedom, some of Joseph's greatest lessons were learned within the walls of this small prison, lessons that assured him that God was in heaven and Joseph was still the Lord's mouthpiece. O oh God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? How long shall thy hand be stayed, and thine eye, yea, thy pure eye, behold from the eternal heavens the wrongs of thy people and of thy servants, and thine ear be penetrated with their cries? Yea, O Lord, how long shall they suffer these wrongs and unlawful oppressions before thine heart shall be softened and thy bowels moved with compassion towards them? In times of trouble for Joseph Smith, both personal and in the church, he often sought the Lord and the Lord blessed him with comforting doctrine not always doctrine that even applied to the exact circumstance, but broad and sweeping doctrine that taught him important principles that would help him not only in his governance of the church, but in his personal life and in his growth as a prophet and as a member of the church. That's no more evidenced than in Liberty Jail when he and colleagues spent miserable time there. The Lord revealed to them sublime doctrines of the priesthood that no influence could be maintained other than through kindness and gentleness and love unfeigned. Doctrines were also taught to them of how trouble came to righteous saints, how the Lord had descended below them all, and that we could all expect to have times of difficulty and trouble, but that those would be times of learning and tempering. From November 1838 to January 1839, Emma was living in Far West while Joseph languished in Liberty Jail. She was able to go visit him on two or three occasions, taking Joseph III with her at least once. He talked in his letters about how meaningful those visits were to him, and obviously to her as well. I received your letter, which I read over and over again. It was a sweet morsel to me. O oh God, grant that I may have the privilege of seeing once more my lovely family in the enjoyment of the sweets of liberty and social life. To press them to my bosom and kiss their lovely cheeks would fill my heart with unspeakable gratitude. Tell the children that I am alive and trust I shall come and see them before long. Comfort their hearts all you can and try to be comforted yourself. I shall not attempt to write my feelings altogether for the situation in which you are. The walls, bars and bolts, rolling rivers, running streams, rising hills, sinking valleys and spreading prairies that separate us. And the cruel injustice that first cast you into prison and still holds you there with other considerations places my feelings far beyond description. Oh, my affectionate Emma. 
I want you to remember that I am a 